cannot explain what is going on. Reservation. The human race has gone bonkers. But it's going to need a human to understand this behavior. A human with the secret to objectivity. It makes no sense. Reservation. We need to find a man whose LinkedIn profile says brands need a whole brain strategic process, including consumer ethnography, multidisciplinary ideation, and commitment to storytelling. We need a man who knows more than how to open Wikipedia. Reservation. But who is this man? Peter Dinklage. Yep, the little guy from Game of Thrones. Stars in the life story of Joe Crump. Razor Vision. How to spend an entire career doing a job too weird to explain to your parents. guys who's looking forward to Game of Thrones a lot right very soon um, so I'll start off by telling you a secret a bit of a, a confession and a very odd setting maybe for this particular one um, in that I actually don't believe that what I do is advertising super ironic given that I work for one of the biggest agency holding companies in the world but I don't think that I do advertising and with any luck today if I make a good case Maybe some of you all will come over to my side and believe that maybe what you're doing is not making advertising either. So um, there are two kinds of people in the world when I show this photograph. Um, about half the room, generally speaking, is horrified. Tattoo a baby, what the hell? Um, and the other half is looking for their brand on there. <laughs> so uh, I'm not sure which half. You're, you're on, but uh, hopefully I'll, I'll say something surprising for, for um, either side. So digital Darwinism, yes, absolutely weird. Um, yes, it harkens back to my background um, in anthropology, but it also, I think, is a reflection of, of what I see going on in this business that we're in, and that is um, an incredible level of innovation and evolution and mutation. If you're, a, if you're a follower of Moore's Law, um, then you know that the number of screens, the number of digital uh, devices in the world is doubling about every 18 to 24 months. So that is driving an unbelievable amount of change. I'm old, everybody seems to reference their increasing baldness here, and I'm another one. Um, I, and I've been around a while, and I have never felt um, that it's harder to keep up than it is today. Our business is changing. Our brands are changing. The people that we're speaking to, our audiences, our consumers are changing faster than ever before. It's just really incredibly hard to keep up these days. Um, so if you're a person that loves change, if you're a person that really embraces that, then this is the best time to be alive. Um, if you're not, uh, then it's probably a good time to, to begin updating your CV and, and uh, make, a, make your way to the exit. Um, as some sort of a metric for this, if you go up on Amazon today um, and search for the topic of branding, brands, brand strategy, you'll see about this many results, w roughly 1.8 million results. So um, these are important questions, right? If you're running a company or if you're in an agency and you're responsible for a brand, you know, what to do with it is it's a kind of a, a big question. And my point of view is if you ask a very important question and you get 1.8 million different answers, you're, you're fucked. <laughs> so today I'm gonna present another answer, um, maybe a little bit different way of looking at the problem. Um, I, and I went and I read all those books for you, so I'm gonna show you six slides and if you just open your heart, open your mind, pay really close attention, you don't have to go read all those books. Six big trends that if you are not aware of these, you've been living in a cave. The first one is people power. You are no longer in control of your brand. Your consumers are in control of your brand. Get it. If you think you're running your brand, you're wrong. The second thing, the social web, right? It's impossible to overstate the importance of social. If you're not 
thinking seriously about social in your daily job as you are in your daily life, again, you're, you really probably should be in a different job. Disloyalty. Consumers are more disloyal today than they ever have been. This is not going to change. I will make very few, few predictions today. This is one. Consumers are going to continue leaving your brand as quickly as they arrive if you don't continue to delight them. Give them something that they've not gotten before. Social responsibility, increasingly important. In every client conversation that we have at Razorfish, at some point this comes up. Should we or should we not be a brand that gives back in one way or another? I think you almost always have to find a way and to do it in an authentic way, but increasingly it's got to be a part of our jobs to help think this through on behalf of our clients. Personality. If your brand doesn't have a personality in some way, um, if it doesn't connect with people in a way that makes them smile or laugh, if it doesn't feel real uh, and human, then you've got a serious problem. And ubiquity. If you're not trying to put your brand everywhere where your audience is, again, serious problem. For a lot of us who grew up thinking that we were making TV spots, for example, um, this is a big shift. Your brand just has to be where the consumer expects your brand to be, which is increasingly everywhere, all the time. So again, now you don't have to go read those 1.8 million books. If you just pay attention, here's what you need to know going forward. But beyond that, who in the audience, show of hands, thinks that they're in the digital business? It's a good, good percentage. So my bet would be that you feel this on a daily basis. You, you, feel, you feel as if somehow you're on the wrong side of the equation. Or you're on the wrong side and everyone else, you're on the right side and everyone else is on the wrong side that a big part of your job on a daily basis is to just get people to see what you see, right? The flip side of that, for all those non-digital folks in the audience who don't feel like that they're on the, on, the, on the right side of digital, you're probably afraid. You probably feel like those guys are the experts, you know? Um, I, I can't write code. Maybe I'm not up on Facebook as much as them. And you feel really alienated. So I, I guess my point is that, believe it or not, I think we're all in the digital business, whether we know it or not. Whether, whether our brands are playing in that space in a meaningful way or not, they're going to be. One of our um, old CEOs at Razorfish used to say that in a world where eventually all brands are digital, we will have been there first. And I, I kind of believe that. When I joined Razorfish a long time ago, I walked into the company uh, kitchen and there was a Coke machine, and you operated the Coke machine with your cell phone. So this is in, in the late 90s when the websites that we built were all being accessed via dial-up modems. Felt a little crazy, right? Not so crazy today, right? The world is changing fast. So on to my pet peeve. Every year, Interbrand releases their top 100 brand list. And every year, it gives me a little bit of an aneurysm. This is 2008's list. In 2008, it struck me that these are all really lovely brands, and frankly, uh, a number of them are our clients. But they just somehow don't strike me as being as relevant as the brands that I experienced on a daily basis in 2008. So if you look at today, this is their list today, and you look at the brands that are highlighted, those are the overlaps. So not a giant amount of change, right? Does it strike anyone as odd that Facebook is not on this list? A little, <laughs> little weird, right? Maybe a lot weird, actually, I think. And so what we did was we started kind of a tracking study at Razorfish that was our answer to Interbrand. So every year I poll the global roughly 2,000, 2,500 employees of Razorfish and I ask them, what are the most digital brands on the planet? What are the brands that are most relevant to you? Just as a kind of an antidote to this dumb, to me, vaguely ridiculous <laughs> interbrand, interbrand list. So here's our answer in 2008. So the sort of collective consciousness, the wisdom of crowds at Razorfish, 
said were the most important digital brands. Anybody using MySpace today? Right? Here's 2010. The world is changing, this is 2012, sorry, the world is changing very, very fast. So just in that very short amount of time, you see the arrival of Facebook. Wow. Not present in, in 2008, extremely present in 2012. And here's the overlap. Just two brands, right, have had a legacy of four years. Just two brands survived that. Three, sorry, I'm sorry, Apple, uh, YouTube, and Google. It's a very Darwinian world, this, this internet thing. Um, brands that are amazing one year go and ju just disappear the next. So it's a tough time to be in, the, in this business, right? It's tough whether you're running a brand, whether you're running a company, or whether you're working in an agency and trying to help a brand be successful in this world. It's very challenging, right? It is a, it is a Darwinian world. Only the strong will survive. So here we are, interbrand versus the digital brands. What do you guys think? Which is the better list? Jury's out. This is the only overlap, Apple and Google, between the interbrand list and the digital brands list. Now, obviously, the interbrand list, these are storied brands. They've been around for a long time, and they're probably not going anywhere. But these digital brands have something really powerful about them, something really, really unique. And my hypothesis today is that the thing that makes them unique is knowable. It's a, it is a non-random and non-trivial thing. I think of it in a way as uh, the genes of these brands. All brands, I think, have these genes. They have a kind of a DNA. And whether, the, whether they claim to be digital brands or not, that DNA is there. And I think you can maybe think of it like the knobs on a dashboard that you, whether you're working at a company and you're responsible for a brand or you're working at an agency and you're helping a brand to be more successful, can kind of dial those knobs up or down depending on the brand, depending on, depending on the consumer of the brand. So I'm going to show you, I think there are seven, um, and hopefully maybe it's something you can take back to your jobs and use. So the first one is authenticity. I suspect we, we won't find anyone in the audience that would disagree that it's incredibly important that a brand be authentic, that it feel uh, genuine, right? If you don't at least have authenticity in, in your brand, you don't have a lot to work with, right? So I'm gonna show you um, a short film, actually it was referred to by folks, several folks today, uh, called Life in a Day. I think this is a, an interesting project for two reasons. Um, one, because it was made by Ridley Scott, um, you know, who's an epic director um, and who's made legendarily kind of iconic movies. And the second was because this movie was not made by him. It was made by 80,000 people who sent in short films that were made on a single day, many of which were actually made with their own cell phone cameras. Good morning, everyone. iconic director like Ridley says that the most authentic statement he can make is one that's made by you guys. Um, a, lot of, a lot of content produced via cell phone camera. I mean, it's, the world has changed. So the next one is adaptive, right? I believe that great brands going forward need to be adaptive. Darwin believed that it wasn't the strong that survived. It wasn't the smart that survived. 
It was the most adaptive, it was the most nimble that survived. Brands spend so much time, companies spend so much energy trying to get it right, right? Trying to have a brand, right? Have a position, do a mission statement. If I had a buck for every mission statement I've ever written, much, much more valuable to be adaptive, to know that your company is going to be dramatically different in six months than it is today. This is from Korea. I know you guys, I heard um, yesterday that an experiment like this is going on right now with, with Woolworths right here. So again, um, if you're in the retail business, if you're not doing experiments like this right now, again, I promise you will be in 24 months. Relevant. Show of hands again. Who's using Flipboard now? Yeah, good, awesome. So you have 500 million people that are uh, in your company. Super, super powerful experience. Um, I started out in the world as a journalist, worked for a long time as a magazine editor, and one of the things that you learn if you're a magazine editor is that you know better. Frankly, you're just smarter than everyone else. Not so much anymore. This is a shocking development for people like me in the magazine business, people who are editors who presume to know better. Because what you learn is that you're not nearly as important as the friends of your readers. This is my iPad, and this is my Flipboard. Your Flipboard is your personal magazine. It always has content you care about, and it knows what you care about because it knows who your friends are. This is all stuff my Twitter friends are linking to, articles and images they think I should see. Your Flipboard connects to your social networks and gathers all the good stuff your friends are sharing. Any type of content your friends can share, Articles, images, photo albums, and video, they all come to you. And you can always handpick from Flipboard's own collections, from some of the most interesting sources on the web. It's your magazine. It's your Flipboard. The stuff you care about, all in one place. So if you're not using Flipboard, please go use it. It's really fun. It's a transformational experience. Speaking of which, um, this is a pro bono project that, that we did um, about three months ago, actually, for the TED conference. Um, there's a, every year TED awards a TED prize, um, which historically has gone to a person or an organization that's presuming by virtue of the work that they're doing to change the world. Um, this year, for the first time, that prize did not go to a person, but it went to an idea. And the idea was the city, the city of the future. Um, whether, whether you recognize it or not, what happens with cities globally is going to determine the future of our culture globally. Um, and so what we did was try to create an online experience that harvests the social networks of everyone who engages with it and allows them to express a passion about the place that they live. You all uh, live in one of the greatest cities of the world. Almost anyone on the planet would probably agree, that, agree with that. So just go online if you would and uh, register yourself and tell us what you care about, whether it's parking or surfing, uh, whether it's a uh, green building um, or schools. Just let us know. It's a, we call it a, a happiness machine because we think what it will allow people to do is find one another. If you're interested in parking in Sydney, it will bring you together with other people who are interested in improving the parking situation in Sydney. It's a short film that explains it a little bit. I am the crucible of the future. I am where humanity will either flourish or fade. I am being built and rebuilt every day. I am inevitable, but I am not yet determined. I wish to be inclusive, innovative, healthy, soulful, thriving. But my potential can only be reached through you. You can forge a new urban outlook. Begin by connecting. Imagine a platform that brings you together, locally and globally. Combine the reach of the cloud with the power of the crowd. Connect leaders, experts, companies, organizations and citizens. Share your tools, data, designs, successes and ideas. Turn them into action. 
Together, you can bridge the gap between poor and rich communities. Spectacularly reduce your carbon footprint. Make nature part of daily life. Empower entrepreneurship. Reimagine education. Nurture health. I'm the city 2.0. Dream me. Build me. Make me real. So please uh, do me a favor. Go online. Express your passion about the city that you live in. Oops, sorry. Fresh. So when I started at Razorfish way back in the day, um, I kind of made a fetish about beating up on the TV people. As a digital person, a giant chip on my shoulder, um, and believed that I was kind of an order of magnitude smarter, frankly, than the people who made TV spots. Increasingly, in the great revenge of life, um, Razorfish is, is being asked to be lead agency. And so that chip has come off my shoulder, and I'm now finding myself making TV spots. So it's, it's, it's funny how these things work out. Um, and, you know, it's a challenge, right, um, for those of us who, who kind of grew up in digital, thinking about the things that um, great storytellers, great movie makers have always thought about is a, a new process, a super fun fascinating process. Um, and I think the thing that we aspire to do is, you know, is just pay, make people feel like they've seen something fresh. There are only so many stories allegedly in the world, and so you just tell them over and over again um, in a slightly different accent. And uh, here's one that, from this year that I, that I liked a lot. Life boils down to a series of choices. Before long, the choices you make and the ones you don't become you. But which you? Worse. Better. Someone you can't even recognize. It can make you question everything. Whether you're strong enough, good enough, all choices lead you somewhere. Bold choices take you where you're supposed to be. Fresh. So again, you know, regardless of the brand that you're working for, the company that you're working for, there's a way to tell a story about it that feels new. And uh, that's sort of the holy grail. Immersiveness. In the digital world, this is something that we've lived with for a long time. Once upon a time, it got called being sticky, which always kind of creeped me out. Um, but immersion, the ability to create an experience for people in which they lose track of time, that's really worthy of their time, is a very powerful goal to have, and a really, a really good one. So an example from this past year, um, I, I can't tell you how much time I spent um, with this next experience, and if you have kids, maybe you know it already. Um, it won the Academy Award this year for Best Short Film.
please go to the App Store immediately and down, download it. It's really fabulous, and it, it makes you think again about what movies are and what applications are. Um, these things are happening every day. So the social experience of the moment, who uses Pinterest these days? Awesome, good. Um, so it's, you know, in one year, who even a year ago, who, who was talking about Pinterest, right? So look, this is a phenomenon that came out of nowhere, um, which is increasingly uh, the norm, I think, in the social space. Um, so it's already achieved the, the volume that Twitter did in three years. So extremely powerful, setting all the copyright issues aside are substantial. Um, you know, every client engagement that I'm working on right now, we're talking about Pinterest. We're, we're thinking about what it means. Um, whether we're engaging it or not is, a, again, a, a decision that we make based on that dashboard. But um, definitely, it should be uh, one of the tools in your toolbox that you're thinking about. So. Um, at the end, I'm going to show you guys my email address and you can write me, but um, one of the things that we do and have been doing for a long time as a way of diagnosing um, what our options are with, a, with an engagement um, for clients, we use these genes, these seven brand genes, as a way of assessing um, the strengths and weaknesses of a company and a brand based on those those criteria, those seven criteria. We can do the same for, the, for a client's competitors. Now, once upon a time, I used to run creative for, for Razorfish, and I know the terror of the blank page, like all the options that are available to you when you begin an engagement. And in a way, in a way um, this scorecard and these brand genes were a way of carving up that terror, right, and pointing a team uh, in a direction that's more likely than not to be fruitful. Um, so I would encourage you, um, again, whether, whether you're on the digital side or the non-digital side of that line, um, this is something that everyone can use. I just would encourage you to play with it. It's a spreadsheet. For those of you who like spreadsheets, probably not a crowd that over-indexes on the uses of spreadsheets, but still, it's, it's a fun thing to do. So um, in the interest of kind of demoing that. Um, what we did was we rated the 2012 interbrand list versus uh, the Razorfish digital brand list, averaging them together. Um, these are the top five, if I can make this laser pointer work, um, the top five interbrand brands and the top five digital brands, we averaged them together and shockingly, the digital, digital brands score substantially higher on average than the interbrand brands. So let's drill down a little deeper. So here we are, again, averaging all of the interbrand brands, those in yellow, uh, together, and all of the digital brands together, the ones in green, across each of those seven brand genes. So what you learn, you probably would know this almost intuitively, um, what you see is that the interbrand brands kind of have particularly low scores on adaptivity, on social, and on their immersiveness. That seems somehow intuitively correct, right? The digital brands, on the other hand, score really well on authenticity, because in general, they're allowing their consumers to engage with them. Um, on social, because digital brands are profoundly social. Um, and on adaptivity, because in the digital space, brands have to be able to move and react. So again, just a, a way of thinking about the world and carving it up. And then one level down. So when's the last time any of you went to hp.com to check out what was new? <laughs> this, I think, is why. It is not a digital brand, despite the fact that they make a crap load of digital stuff. Not a digital brand. So if I were working at HP, or if I were the agency that was, this would be I would, where I'd start fishing. I'd start trying to make an impact on immersiveness, on authenticity, on some of these, on these brand genes. So hopefully you can take this home and use it, play with it. Um, it's fun at minimum, and hopefully maybe more than that. Here are all the brand genes as a wrap up. So I said at the very beginning, 
my confession that I didn't think that I was in the advertising business. I actually think that I'm in the experience business. Um, and sometimes, more often than not, that means I'm in the product development business. And so, a lot of products fail in the world. Um, we heard earlier that 80% of movies fail. Roughly 89 to 90% of new products fail. It's even worse failure rate. So how, do, how are you more likely than not to make a product that's going to succeed? I think there's, again, a relatively small set of tools. They're really tricks, to be honest, um, that you can use to get there, to help your clients think rather than that they're in the communications business, that they're in the product development business, that they're in the experience business. All of these brands are iconic. They're iconic not because they did great advertising, although some of them did. They're iconic because the first time you experienced them, they felt really profoundly different. They felt like they were giving something to you that you maybe had never gotten before. I think all of our brands can get that way. I think they can all do that. Again, if you get out of the communications business, get out of the advertising business, and get into the product development business, into the experience business. So the first little trick in my bag of tricks, back from my days kind of as, as an anthropologist, find an unmet need. I guarantee if you just pay attention on behalf of your clients or on behalf of your company, you can find an unmet need. Another show of hands. Who does not like toasties? Toasties, grilled cheese as we say in the US. Anyone not like toasties? Of course not. Everyone likes toasties. Guess what? At least in the US, maybe you guys have such a thing. There's no restaurant, there's no quick service restaurant where you can go and get a toasty. They just don't exist. Everyone loves them, cannot go get them. <laughs> That's an unmet need. It's an unmet need that was observed and seized upon by actually the guy that started Flip Video, Flip Video Camera. After he got out of that business, he started this business. It's called The Melt. It's a chain of restaurants that make toasties and that also have digital at their core. So you can go get the app. You can go fool around with it now. You'd have to drive to San Francisco to get a toasty there. But download the app. You can make your order online, show up at the restaurant, um, and they give you a QR code. And there, presto changeo, is your toasty ready and waiting for you. Within two years, there'll be 500 of these setting aside the health issues. There will be 500 of these restaurants in, in the United States where a lot of bad health problems come from. And second thing, once you have that unmet need, just go and invent something, right? A lot of us work for big companies, right? Big brands, complicated organizational structures, lots of politics. You know what? Sometimes you just have to say, fuck it and go and invent something, right? This is a slide, um, an example from the latest TED conference um, in February. The bird on the left, not a bird, it's a drone. It was presented by the head of DARPA, the super spooky uh, defense research organization. It's part of the Defense Department in the United States. It's not an accident that it looks like a hummingbird. Um, if you're a head of state somewhere and you see a hummingbird like that hovering around your head, you should be super concerned. <laughs> Very sophisticated, probably billion dollar little bird. Um, they also have, apparently, they have these things that are the size of minnows that swim in rivers. Just if you need any further ammunition to be terrified about what's going on. Um, and the one there on your right, um, was a series of drones that were built by two students at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, essentially, you can see if you look, I'm gonna show you a little video. If you look very, very closely, you can see that they're basically held together quite literally with rubber bands. So, big, expensive answer to the problem, something you can do in your garage. All of us, I think, can think like this about our brands. These are all operating independently.
crazy, right? Amazing. So these two guys who looked just about as stunned as two human beings ever could that they were on, standing on the TED stage presenting this, as they walked out of the TED auditorium, which is filled with uh, a lot of people like them and also an awful lot of billionaires and an awful lot of venture capitalists, were swarmed by venture capitalists. So I heard a rumor that by the end of the next day they had formed a company, <laughs> probably soon to be working for DARPA, no doubt. But. So again, you know, there's the big expensive answer to every question, and there's also the answer that you built in your garage, right, just because you were passionate. They're both important. There's one that's completely in your control. Go beta. So again, once you've found that unmet need, uh, once you've invented something, just get shit out there, right? Zuckerberg says that if they launch something and it's perfect, he knows that they've screwed up. Right? Most of us work for companies, for brands that fetishize perfection. This is not a world that values or rewards perfection. Today, today um, what's rewarded is brands that are trying to do right, companies that are trying to make a difference. Again, perfection is overrated. Just get it out there. Right? This is a site that was launched by the Cameron government in the UK uh, prior to the Olympics to really start to solicit input on how to make the Olympics experience better for people. It was launched with literally thousands and thousands of bugs. People appreciated the effort, right? They appreciated that anyone even asked, and they helped to make it better. So again, just get your stuff out there. Consumers will help you if they think you have good intentions. Consumers will help you today, and increasingly they can, and they expect to. So go beta. And pay attention. So I happen to live um, part-time in, in Brazil. And any of, the, any of you who have been to Brazil know that this is not a Photoshopped image. Um, Brazil is a place where the very rich and the very poor quite literally can live just a few feet apart. This happens to be about a three-minute walk from my office in Sao Paulo. Again, just being really honest. Now, not being PC. So being really honest, if you were going to sort of make a, a guess, in this photograph, who do you think is the most digital? Who do you think spends more time online, for example? Is it the folks in the luxury high-rise? Raise your hand. Okay, come on. Right. Most of us would think so, right? Not true. The folks in the favela spend roughly 20 to 30% more time online. You have to pay attention to see these things, right? Because conventional wisdom is frequently wrong. Innovation is frequently hiding in plain sight. The future of Brazil is going to be built by the folks living in the favela. They know, for example, the educational system in Brazil is not going to get great anytime soon. If their kids are going to get educated, it's because they're going to get educated online. Nine out of 10 PCs that were purchased in Brazil last year were purchased by those folks, not those folks. Really powerful. If you just pay attention to the consumers, both the current consumers and the fringe consumers of your clients' brands, you're going to find things like this. And then, you're never done. This is the beautiful thing. Again, if you love change, you have to embrace evolution. You are never, ever done. So I think probably, the guy who invented post-it notes for 3M thought that he was done. Not so much. I would venture to say that 100% of you have smartphones in your pocket. The covering on the screen of your, of your smartphone is exactly the same chemical substance that, that was behind the post-it note. 37 patents have come from that single discovery. It's a gift that just keeps on giving. Have to embrace evolution. So if you remember nothing else, forget everything, forget even the crazy drones and the James Bond theme, just please remember this. If you believe, like I believe, that you're not in the advertising business, or that you're in the experience business, then you have to believe this, that a perfect experience will market itself. One of my favorite designers, Yves Bahar, says, that advertising is the price a company pays for failing to innovate. 
I believe that passionately, and I believe it's our job to innovate on behalf of our companies and the brands that we work for. Thank you. <laughs>